I began the work with chimpanzees in 1960 and spent most of each year with them, learning and studying and writing papers. And then in 1986, for the very first time, we brought together the different scientists who by then were studying chimpanzees in different parts of their range in Africa. And it was, it was a very shocking experience because we had a session on conservation and in every single case, forests were disappearing, chimpanzee numbers were plummeting. There was the beginning of the bushmeat trade, the commercial hunting of wild animals for food. There was the invasion of foreign logging companies and mining companies. And there was also the catching of chimps in snares, the shooting of mothers to catch babies for the live animal trade. And when I started working in Gombe, there was, there was no need to be a conservation. There was nothing, it was all there. It was after I began, it was in the 70s, that the real onslaught on the natural world began in Africa. And so when I began, I didn't think environmentalism was even a concept. It came to a head when I flew over the tiny Gombe National Park in 1990 in a small single engine plane and looked down, I was utterly shocked to see a little island of forest surrounded by completely bare hills. And when I began in 1960, that little patch of forest was part of an unbroken, we called it the equatorial forest belt, stretching from East Africa right to the West African coast. And as I looked down and realized there were more people living there than the land could support, too poor to buy food from elsewhere, overused farmland, infertile soil, people struggling to survive. That's when I realized that if we didn't do something to improve their lives, we couldn't even try to help the chimpanzees. After this shock <laughs> flying over Gombe, I was fortunate enough to meet uh, a man called George Strunden, who'd worked for the European Union for, I think, 15 years in agriculture. And so we sat down and talked about what could be done and made a plan to help the villagers around Gombe, 12 of them, in a very holistic way. Instead of walking into the villages like so many well-meaning but unfortunate uh, people giving aid. George picked a team of local Tanzanians. There wasn't even a PhD among them, but they'd all worked uh, with NGOs in forestry and education and health and so on. And they went into the villages and they sat down with the elders and asked them what they thought we could do to make their lives better. And that's where we started. More food, which meant restoring fertility to the over overused farmland, better education, better health facilities and the villagers came to trust us so we were able to introduce water management programs and then what I sincerely believe has been the most important intervention microcredit programs particularly for women so in these 12 villages we set up these microcredit programs and it was for groups of five women two men could join they mostly didn't because they didn't like to be outnumbered by women. The women had to choose environmentally sustainable projects. That was the one key. And if they succeeded and they paid back the money, then they could take out a bigger loan if they wished. And at the same time, we were providing as many scholarships as we could, keep girls in school after puberty. And to do that, it meant that we had to find money to build um, hygienic latrines offering some privacy to the girls and we also provided family planning. As this became so successful we moved out 
So now we're working in 52 villages and we can affect not just those around the tiny national park, but moving out into areas where there's still some remnant chimp groups. And down south, which is where most of Tanzania's remaining 2,000 chimps are, outside any protected area. I think one of the magic things is each of the 52 villages has provided one or two, depending on the size of their forest, men who train to be forest monitors. And they, even if they can't read and write, they learn to use smartphones and they go into their forests and they're very proud. And if they see an illegally cut tree, you know, they press the button and they make a photograph. Or if they see uh, an animal trap or a cartridge on the ground, or on the other side, if they see a chimp nest or a leopard, then all of this gets uploaded to this platform on the clouds, uh, Global Forest Watch. So everything's transparent. And the decision makers in the villages can no longer pretend they don't know what's going on in their forest. Um, so it's made a huge difference. And there's no more bare hills. And they have set aside a large area around Gombe to act as a buffer zone between the chimps and the villages. The trees have come back there. And we're still working on corridors of forests to link the chimps of Gombe, who were completely isolated, cut off. Um, last year, we had the huge success. Two females came in from outside, bringing much needed uh, genetic material with them because there's less than 100 chimps at Gombe. When I started, I was wanting to live with the chimpanzees and learn about their behavior and write books about them. I didn't even want to be a scientist because when I was growing up, girls weren't scientists. Certainly not that kind of scientist. You know, you were a nurse or you were a, a teacher or you were perhaps a missionary's wife might be the closest you got to what I dreamed of, living with wild animals. And I went to that conference, you know, I had my PhD by then, I was a scientist, and I left as an activist. When I left it, I don't remember even <clears throat> making a decision. It was just a change. And there was no asking myself, well, can I bear to live in this different way? It was just something saying, I don't know what you can do, but you've got to try and do something. And so one thing led to another, and a person who was basically wanting to be out in nature alone and very shy has become the Jane Goodall of today. And, you know, there are times when you really feel, come on, how much longer can we keep on fighting? But then I remember uh, I've got grandchildren, and I think, no, we have to go on. We just have to make change.